Good morning. Good morning. There's always a danger when you're the third speaker from the same district uh, that, you're, uh, that your points have already been covered. I've got more lines through my notes here than, than, uh, than I intended. But uh, I'd like to say offhand, I've really enjoyed every speaker so far, right from Randy setting the tone for us today and giving us the overview to, uh, to each, each speaker who's brought their perspective forward. And, and I have to say, the one that resonated the most for me was Jeremy, because he and I think alike. Uh, when I was in schools, I was very much of the mind, tell me what I'm responsible for, give me my resources, and leave me alone. Because we've got the expertise in this building and in this community to get the job done, and we will show you things that are beyond your expectations. And so that was always uh, the orientation that, that we came from. Uh, came from. And, uh, and I have to say, his five answers are the right answers. They're perfect. They're, they're, they're aligned with what we were doing and, and what we, our beliefs have been in Edmonton over the years. Except if I could take the liberty, I would add one more. And number six for me would be everyone has one boss. And that person is the one who sets your outcomes that you're responsible for, allocates your resources, and ultimately evaluates your performance. Because you can't do a job when you're getting that kind of input from, from a variety of sources. You need one person. And th this kind of goes full circle to what Sandra was talking about when she talked about the history of our district and how when Mike was there for 22 years, everybody knew exactly what they were responsible for. Everybody knew how all the pieces fit together. You knew what part you played in getting district level results. And then as we moved through a series of superintendents after Mike left, we lost some of that. And, and the biggest mistake, in my view, was when that level of associate superintendents was removed and you have 200 principals reporting to a superintendent, which is an unworkable model, and a superintendent can't possibly have a presence in the schools when he's got superintendent level responsibilities. And so what happened was principals were able to carry on for a while because they were well well prepared for their jobs, they were well mentored, well coached, they knew what they had to do and they could do it. But as we started to turn people over in a few years and, and, and new principals were coming in without that previous experience of working with close supervision, then things started to tail off. The good news is that we're coming full circle and getting back to where we should be. And uh, so when we get to the, the keynote presentation tomorrow, what I'm going to talk about, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I've uh, spent 40 years with Edmonton Public, and that was partly school-based, partly central office-based. I had the great good fortune to be an associate superintendent working with Mike Stravinsky when he was there as part of a team that was setting district direction and working closely with principals to, to do their job and achieve their results. And uh, then, uh, after we had our flattening of the organization and the associate superintendents became extinct. Uh, then I had the opportunity to go to Jasper Place High School and I spent 12 years there um, and, and it was a, a wonderful 12 years of my career. And so when we get to the uh, keynote, what I'm going to refer to is how the site-based decision-making model impacted the role within central office as an associate superintendent, how we fit, what we did, how we related with schools, and then from the field perspective, as a principal in a school and working with, with the staff, how that impacted our performance, and, uh, and hopefully there'll be something of value there for, for you. Um, as we came full circle, uh, the position was recreated as assistant superintendents. And I came back downtown and, and came into that role again, working closely with principals. And so, different model, but the same general approach. And so, that's what my keynote's going to be about. And uh, so, 
I just have a few general comments. And your, the key question that you're facing today is, or one of the key questions is, what do we mean by school empowerment? What do we mean by site-based decision making? And I had a chance to, to look through your pre-conference feedback, and there was two main themes in there, along with some others. But the main themes that were coming through was that it should be a results-based uh, approach, that you should be looking at your outcomes and not having process mandated, because the expertise is in the schools. And the second part was um, just was just that people closest to the action make make the decisions on how to impact teaching and learning. And so people on uh, the site make the decision, and you're you're being evaluated on the results that you achieve. So those were two main themes. You've, you've heard several other comments here this morning about uh, uh, what school empowerment can mean. But ultimately, the answer is what's right for you. What's right for you and what's going to impact the teaching and learning of all of your students in your schools. And that should define what school empowerment will look like because it's different in every jurisdiction. One of the distinctions I'd like to make is that when we have these conversations about initiatives towards school empowerment or site-based, they're quite often viewed as changes in organizational structure. And they do have some changes, but they're much more than that. What we're really talking about is a cultural shift. We're transforming the culture of the jurisdiction. It's gonna have an impact on our belief system. It's gonna have an impact on our practices. It's going to have an impact on our working relationships and the roles that we take on. Everything changes and it becomes part of the identity change of the jurisdiction. And it's that cultural shift that really drives everything. One of the things to keep in mind again is it has to be what's right for your jurisdiction you can't just put somebody else's model in place. You can draw ideas from other people and put them together for yourself. Just a little interesting aside, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, probably half a dozen years ago, and I was visiting some schools. And I had a conversation with one of the principals, and we started talking about school-based budgeting. And, uh, and empowerment, and he said, oh, we have that, it's in place already. And I said, tell me about it. And he said, every school here has the opportunity to have up to $5,000 in discretionary funding. And all we have to do is fill out these forms and describe our project and why it's the right thing to do for our school and send them off and get the approval, and we get that $5,000, and we can use it as discretionary money, as long as we put it towards our project. And I remembered at the time, thinking to myself, because I didn't want to be impolite, but I thought, wouldn't it be better if they just gave the money without all the form filling out and requests, and just demonstrate a little trust? And secondly, I was thinking, you know, if this was 500,000 or 5 million, now you've got some real site-based decision-making power. But when I thought about it afterwards, I changed my thinking because what I realized was because they had that opportunity for $5,000 in discretionary money, they had all those discussions at the school level. Of, you know, it's 5,000, but it's ours and we can do something with it. And it caused them to evaluate their teaching practices and, and what they were trying to achieve and what was possible if they just had a little bit more that they could determine how to, how to expand. And, and the value of those discussions was achieved even with just a little bit of money. So that, I guess the message in here is, is part of that process 
of, of empowering schools to make decisions, even if it's baby steps. And then you can always build on it. There's also, I think, a common practice when we think about school empowerment. We talk about centralization and decentralization as though they're polar opposites, two ends to a spectrum. And it's an either or, you've got to be this or you've got to be that. And in reality, to be a strong, cohesive district, you need both. What you need from a centralized perspective is you need that strong vision for the district of this is what we need, this is where we're trying to move towards, this is what we're, we're trying to achieve. So that vision has to be common as a district vision, and it has to come from your senior staff. But then you also need the flexibility for individual schools to operationalize that vision in terms of how do you take the resources you have and make gains in those areas at your school so that cumulatively the whole district is making gains in those areas. So that mix of strong central vision with some freedom and flexibility at the school level is the best uh, way to achieve your goals. In our model, our central services departments also needed to undergo some major changes. And the major changes we're talking about was from one of directing schools to one of supporting schools. Seems like a pretty simple concept. But it doesn't just happen. And there is resistance and there's pushback because people in those positions who have been directing schools and controlling resources are somewhat threatened by turning that over to, to individual schools. Partly because they're not sure what it will mean to their jobs, but partly because maybe they don't think schools are competent to do it. So what you really need, again, from a central authority is to say, this is the way it's going to be. You are going to be a support network for the schools. Because going back to what we heard from some others, the most important work, the critical work, takes place in the classrooms between teachers and students. And they are going to request the supports they need to get the job done. And somebody has to, has to respond to those requests. And that's your central services. And so instead of saying, this is how we are supporting all schools, they have to be in a position where they can say, we're getting requests from schools for these kind of supports. Even if they're different from different schools, they have to find a way to respond and address those needs. That's, that's how you get to the point where all of your district staff are supporting the teaching and learning process. Another point is, is just to keep in mind that this whole process of change is complex. It's a whole series of checks and balances and you can't just plug it in. It's one where you have to initiate in stages. You take some small steps, you build on them, you adjust what's working and take out what isn't and move to the next step. People have to be ready to take it on. And not everybody is ready. People are in different places and you have to work with your staff throughout the district in terms of what will this new philosophy look like when it goes into place. And so as staff are taking on new roles or changing roles, they're also developing new skills. There has to be some district level training and there has to be some patience to work with people as they're moving into their new challenge. Along with that goes to changing working relationships in terms of, of uh, how you set up those contacts between schools, between schools at the central, between principals and their, and their supervisors, so that it is a supportive model and, uh, and everybody can be pulling in the same direction. You have to decide as you're phasing it in, how far can you go? And what is what are the areas that you're willing to uh, to move to school decision making. Are you talking about staffing selection? Are you 
you talking about uh, purchasing of uh, resources? Are you talking about programming options? Are you talking about how students are groups, construction of minutes? You can go down that gambit. There are many uh, areas that have to be addressed. And you can't just plug it in all at once. You have to decide where to start and then build on. So I want to kind of conclude with three things. A little list of benefits that we observed, uh, a little list of challenges that we've been dealing with, and a caution. So in terms of the benefits, the obvious first one is high level of student achievement. That's really why you look at these kinds of changes. It's, it's the outcome you're looking for. The teaching and learning process is successful students are achieving at high levels. And partly that's because school-based people can respond to the specific needs of the students in their specific school. And schools are, have a lot of commonalities, but they're also unique in other ways. And so you have to give them the freedom to be able to address the needs of their students and uh, if you want them to achieve at high levels. Another benefit was much higher levels of staff satisfaction and staff motivation. And the reason that happens, of course, is staff are taking ownership of, of their assignments. And there's, there's something about it when, when people in schools are trying to do the best job they can and they've got some good ideas. If we could just do this or if we could just change that, we could really move our agenda forward and they're running into roadblocks. Either they can't get permission or they can't get the resources to support it. Once they have the freedom to be able to put some of their ideas and innovations into action, then people get energized and they put much more energy into their work. They're going to find a way to make it work regardless. And, and that's when you see your staff really proud to be part of the operation and again, that feeds back to higher levels of student achievement. And along that is also an sorry, along with that is also an increase in, in community and parental support. Because they're involved in the process at the school level. And any time that you give people a voice, when you are asking uh, not only your staff and your students, but your parents and your community members about what they would like to see. And when you're communicating what your plans are and getting feedback, even if they don't agree with every decision, they will feel much more valued and much more supportive towards the school because you're having those conversations. And so as a result, the whole system will, will get a higher rating on behalf of the community and the parents. And that support is really valuable when you're trying to make changes. And the last uh, that I'll mention under benefits is uh, a more efficient use of resources. When you can have target, targeted purchasing, uh, you can spend the money, because it's always a limited resource. If you want to get the best bang for your buck, and if all schools don't need the same things. So if you're able to use the resources you have for what is going to be the most valuable for your programming, uh, then that's, that's going to to make a, a much better expenditure. The challenges that we faced, there was an original lack of confidence and trust, mostly by central staff. The principals were capable of taking on the new responsibilities and succeeding. And that's critical. I mean, that, that's a killer. Because that is, the, between the school-based staff, our are the expertise when it comes to teaching and learning. And you have to make sure that they feel valued and that, uh, that you have confidence. And you'll find that when people are given a, a challenge, they always will rise. They'll rise to the challenge and surprise you with how capable they really are. Uh, I mentioned about the readiness level of staff uh, at all levels to move the agenda forward. That's a challenge and that's one that has to be addressed in terms of of professional upgrading and, and, uh, and support. There was also, we faced an unwillingness of some central leaders to let go of the areas and the responsibilities that had previously been theirs. And, uh, and they fought to hang on to it until they were directed to let go. 
and, and that's really uh, something that had to be overcome. And there's always a little bit of a tendency to micromanage when people move into new roles, because after all, they're probably going to make mistakes, so you've got to look over their shoulder and give them lots of suggestions. But for people to grow in those roles, you have to give them the freedom to sometimes make mistakes, learn from them, and, and move in, 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 into a more positive direction. One that came to mind when I was listening to Sandra, we ran into another challenge late in the game. And that was the fact that, as she mentioned, she came into the district and we were already on site based, and, and that was all she knew. Well, Sandra is not alone. There are an awful lot of our staff that when they started with the district, we were a site-based district, and this is the way it was. They didn't know what life was like before. And so as a result, we ran into something, I'll, I'll call it complacency for lack of a, of a better word, but we had some principles that were saying, you know, I don't know why I should be the one that's looking after the maintenance of the building. Uh, you know, why can't we give that to Centrals and, and let, let the maintenance department just give that part of the money back and let them decide, because they'll look after all of the buildings. Which seemed like not a terrible idea, but in reality it was. Because if you looked at the money that our district had allocated for maintenance, and if you looked at the amount of money that was spent on maintenance every year, it far exceeded the amount that was allocated. Because principals and staffs and communities <coughs> had the flexibility within their budgets that they could allocate additional money into maintenance. So if you really need to get some painting done because your school is looking shabby, or you really need to get some wiring done to support new technology, and there wasn't <coughs> enough in your maintenance budget, you could do other things. You, you could adjust some of your budgets to put more in, into maintenance. Maybe you do without purchasing some of the new textbooks for one year. Or maybe you do with teachers taking on one or two more students in their classes because you could reduce your staffing component a little bit. You could do what you needed to do as long as it was a collective decision. And if the priority was, let's get this place fixed up so we can all be proud to be here every day, then you do it. And so principals and staff did that. And, and we were spending the money on maintenance that was required, which was beyond what was allocated by the province to our district. And so the idea of giving it back, all you're giving back is the allocation piece. All of a sudden, there's not enough money <coughs> to meet the needs of schools. And so you're back into making requests, getting on a list, hearing about, well, the money's gone for this year, but maybe we can get to you next year. And you know that's just a, a step backwards in time. So, but you can see how it happened, because the people who were making those decisions had never faced shortages. And now they were. So that, that was another challenge that came up. So finally, uh, a caution. Everybody's got a caution. Mine is this. School empowerment is not principal empowerment. School empowerment means everyone in that school community has a voice. It means the staff, the students, the parents, the community members all have input. Ultimately, the principal makes the decision and is responsible for the decision. And we'll be sharing that decision with everyone. But not before you have a chance to hear from other people and keep them as part of that shared decision-making model. And so, as long as, as we have that collaboration, uh, you're much, much more likely to meet with success. And, uh, and the principal is a key member, but only one of the key members. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be part of these deliberations. This is really hugely valuable to gather people together on this topic. Regardless of where it leads to, for each of you or collectively for all of you, it's the right thing to be talking about. We're talking about students and learning and how can you best support that. And uh, I really look forward to being part of that discussion for the two days we're here. Thank you.